All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to our IDC seminar uh, for this month. We're uh, privileged to have uh, a visitor to Singapore, uh, Dr. Ren Tumor. Uh, she'll be giving a talk on designing reliable and resilient complex engineered systems, which is great because it expands at least two of our pillars very directly. In fact, I think it expands most of them in, uh, directly and indirectly. Uh, Professor Tumor is currently the Associate Dean for Research and Economic Development as part of the College of Engineering at Oregon State University. Um, she uh, is, is and, and before becoming Associate Dean, was full professor uh, in mechanical engineering, actually in interdisciplinary, uh, with mechanical manufacturing and industrial mechanical, engineering. Mechanical, industrial, and manufacturing. There we go. Um, she, uh, before that, spent a number of years at Ames, NASA, where she ran a research group, uh, and I'll, I'll let her talk, uh, you'll get to play what the type of group was, but ran a research group there uh, after she had uh, graduated from a great faculty. <laughs> uh, it's what I hear anyway. That's uh, what I hear. No, it's joking. <laughs> Don't believe everything um, you hear. We have, right? a lot of history. <laughs> we have a lot of history. Uh, but it's really a privilege to have around. Rem is, is very much a leader, uh, especially in the U.S. in complex systems. She works heavily with DARPA and many of the large programs there. Uh, and what I love about it is very much from a design perspective. And I think you'll hear from this talk. Uh, part of that is very much at the heart of IDC. So please welcome Aram and look forward to a talk. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. This has been an amazing visit so far. I have a day and a half left, so we'll see. Um, IDC is quite impressive. I'm jealous, actually. I want to take pictures and repeat it. So uh, my name is Aram Tumor. I'm, uh, as Chris said, a professor and associate dean. As professor, I'm still involved with our design group um, and our you know, School of Mechanical Industrial and Manufacturing Engineering, but I am 100% with the College of Engineering in my administrative role. Um, so this is actually a luxury for me to do something like this. I, uh, I've reduced my uh, research group to uh, a mere you know, three people, which is really, really, really small for me. Uh, I still have some funded research, so um, I get the privilege of doing some research, but it's uh, it's really nice to be able to talk about it. Um, so we're talking about systems. Um, I know there's a systems group here and a, a design group. And I specifically, my group uh, at NASA and at um, OSU has uh, been looking at systems from, a, uh, from the context of making them reliable and resilient. So before we get there, I, I wanted to give a background, a little bit of background about me and our group, and um, then some, you know, rather high-level introduction to what we do, what my students do, and then end with um, maybe put my associate dean hat on and talk about a little bit about the college as well. So um, three decades ago, I moved to Texas, Austin. Exactly three decades ago. Scary. Uh, to start my undergraduate education in mechanical engineering. Uh, by the time I was done, uh, a young faculty member was hired. Uh, his name is, was, is Chris Wood. This is a picture of him <laughs> much later. Uh, he, was, he was a lot younger than this. He actually, you know, he was just a few years older than I am, you know. Uh, so it was really interesting to have him as, a, uh, as an undergraduate supervisor, um, as well as then he took, convinced me to stay on for a PhD and start in this path of design, this mystifying, bizarre, vague concept of doing design engineering, which is not something that most undergraduates see. Uh, and uh, Chris's class, which we repeat, we have actually the same one at OSU, was my first exposure to this kind of fuzzy thinking. You know, it's not, you don't have an answer necessarily. So at the end of my graduate education, against uh, uh, Chris's wishes, <laughs> I went to NASA. Um, and uh, it was an incredible experience to be at NASA. This is 1998. I started there. Uh, my first project was looking at helicopter vibrations to see how helicopters fail and whether you can actually detect any indication of failure from the signal you collect from a transmission specifically. We had a test bed and also ha had a helicopter at NASA Ames Research Center to, to fly, which was really, really nice. 
And then from that, um, I decided to listen to kind of the voice in the back of my mind, Chris's voice saying, think design, think design. I started thinking about kind of larger systems, you know, how do they fail and do they actually, um, can you actually detect those failures at the design stage? You know, can you do anything about that? And then, you know, a few failures, big cat catastrophic failures happened while I was at NASA. I have the Mars Polar Lander here in the Columbia shuttle. Uh, that really made me think about, you know, why are these failures not caught early? So um, I did quite a bit of work at NASA. I stayed there longer than I ever thought I would. I really thought it was a postdoc, and I stayed on nine plus years. I did a lot of leadership positions, all the way up to deputy area lead. Um, led a really large group there, and um, started doing program management. And that's when I decided that's not really fun. Program management is not really fun at all. It was just kind of removing me from working with students. And I decided to look for faculty positions. And I ended up at Oregon State University in 2006. Um, it's been an incredible ride. The, we've grown tremendously. I was able to have a large impact in the way our school is right now and the college. Um, my passion of working with students came true. I created two, two classes there. The, the project management project class that you see there is my model-based model design class. I also created a risk-based design class that basically teaches the, the methods used in practice and in the research community for, um, to our students at the graduate level. Uh, my first set of three students who graduated, that's a picture of me with my UT outfit. I always get comments about that. Uh, uh, at graduation, all three ended up in academia as uh, my first um, crop of students, as I call them. And uh, I have uh, three more since then who ended up in academia, which has been a really tremendous pleasure for me to mentor them in their academic position. And by far, every one of them says, graduate student life was kind of easy. Those of you who are graduate students, just remember that. Being a professor is a very difficult thing. Um, in 2013, I had an opportunity, uh, a position opened up in the college to represent the, the entire college's research and the support the faculty at large, uh, which challenged me. I kind of need a challenge every once in a while. Um, so I took on this role where I work on large initiatives, putting teams together, building things and leading things, which is uh, you know, what I like to do. Uh, I work with graduate students. What you see here is our last uh, grad expo in Portland. We ac we're actually pretty far from Portland, but all the industry and donors are in Portland, so we spend a lot of time there. And uh, also, I am in charge of mentoring the assistant professors. That are, that's our last uh, set of five faculty members we hired into mechanical, industrial, and manufacturing engineering. And at the college level, we've been hiring about 10 to 15 a year, which has been an incredible, incredible thing to do. Okay, so that's, that's about me a little bit. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about our design engineering lab at Oregon State University. Uh, it's one of the largest dis core design set of faculty in the country. And uh, so I got there, um, only Bob Pesh, the second from the, the other side there, was there. And he's one of the, you know, he's been there a long time and had kind of given up on growing the design uh, group and my one of my conditions when I took the job was that I could do that. I managed to hire Rob Stone out of uh, uh, University of Missouri Rolla back then it's called something else then as a full professor, which was transformative because then the two of us together were able to build this group. Um, la three years ago we lured Matt Campbell out of UT Austin, which was a big coup, and then well, we hired three assistant professors, Chris Hoyle up there. Uh, is about to put it in its tenure package, and the two uh, faculty members, the young ones there, kind of keep our energy going. We cover a broad range of topics between us, but um, it really is mostly based on computational methods. So our students actually do need to be able to code, which is not that easy in mechanical engineering. We have, I have a 30 plus there, but we're cl I've closely, close to you know, over 40 students actually working for the seven of us. Also, we work very collaboratively with a number of faculty, uh, specific faculty in robotics, mechanics, in energy systems. We have a faculty who works for the developing world problems. 
uh, advanced manufacturing and also work closely with computer science and electrical engineering. So it creates a really large environment, kind of like what you have here. Uh, and I, I'm going to leave here thinking this is really what I want to create, which has been something in the back of my mind for a while. Uh, we're very well funded. Uh, to, the, to the left here is my funding uh, record. To the right here is our close industry partnerships. We work very closely with industry. Um, we um, do fundamental research as well as applied research. It really is a pleasure to work with companies that are actually located, large companies that are located in Oregon. Daimler, uh, Intel, HP, and Boeing have a um, large presence in Oregon, as well as smaller companies. And you know, Nike, obviously, is a very different kind of company than what I'm used to working on. Uh, they're not engineered systems, but it's an Im unbelievable design um, place to work with. So we've been building those relationships. And Autodesk, I think you all know that Autodesk uh, vision for digitizing the world is design. So it's been a pleasure working with them. Okay, so that's a little bit of background. So let's, uh, wanted to give again a, a very high level overview of what we do. I had quite a few conversations for, uh, with DITAS and I'm always happy to talk about it later on. So why do we study complex systems? So in the design community, the research community, our challenge is that we have increasingly uh, complex systems that are more and more software intensive. So it becomes really important to understand that interaction between software and hardware. You can't really get away with not doing that. Also, they have increasingly high expectations of uh, safety and reliability. The single failure in, at NASA overshadows every single successful mission that the engineers were able to do, which is a shame. Um, we still have systems that suffer from costly overruns and, um, uh, and sometimes failures. And uh, what we really would like to do is try and find a way of understanding those trade-offs and, and system level impact of decisions that are done in design to be able to avoid some of these things. So, uh, you know, we'd like to see if we can answer questions such as will they perform as specified? Um, will they fail? And if they do fail, um, at what cost? When? How? You know, those are kind of important questions. And more importantly, can the failure be prevented? Can we design the system so that it's um, actually um, resilient to failures? Where um, in, in my group, what we um, are driven by is systems thinking. Uh, model-based approaches and uh, approaching things computationally in order to automate and help the designers uh, design things in an automated way. And then why do we study safety and reliability? That's uh, kind of been my background and passion having worked on my several projects at, as NASA, but it is a very common uh, issue that everybody's um, passionate about addressing. We have amazing systems out there totally amazing engineered systems, but they still fail in very costly and catastrophic ways. And the primary cause ends up being some kind of emergent behavior that, have, that had not been predicted or modeled or uh, known at all due to some, unpredict uh, some interaction that was not known. Um, the Mars Polar Lander, again, happened while I was there. That was a software-hardware interaction. The software basically sent a signal to, uh, to shut off the engine, thinking that the vibrations were so strong that it thought that it landed. And it was 40 kilometers, I uh, can't remember the distance, but quite a ways up. Um, so that's the prediction anyway, because they didn't actually go to Mars to see what happened. Um, the V2 crash, again, was a sensor fault, uh, control fault. And you know, one of the biggest ones, Deepwater Horizon, that dollar amount is not even quantifiable, uh, was a systemic set of failures. It's basically a cascading set of failures that could have all been uh, addressed, predicted during design. The cost um, is un um, unbelievable for these failures, and there's many, many examples of that. So you know, our uh, philosophy is that these failures should have been caught during design at the design stage. I want to put this slide up in case you get bored and you want to leave. Just I want you to leave with three things, takeaways. Um, we want to think early design, put, things, uh, put the methods into the early design process. 
We want to think systems. We want to do analysis at the system level, uh, often in my case with models, but it doesn't have to be. And we want to think automation. We really want to be able to automate these processes to help designers in uh, the growing set of uh, issues that they have to address as uh, designers. All right, so we focus on the early design stages. Uh, you're all familiar with some version of um, uh, the design process here. This is, happens to be from Dave Allman's book, which we just talked about in a little bit. So we're uh, really looking at the conceptual design phase where uh, decisions are cheap to reverse. And in, as a result, it's a very cheap and best place to catch potential failures and possibly into include mitigation functions into the design. If you look at that more carefully, we all know that there's very many tools and approaches we use in those phases to be able to make decisions. Um, the question is, what can we add so that we can actually allow failure and uh, dis failure mitigation and analysis into that process? We also focus on safety and reliability and integrating that into the system design process. One of my favorite, favorite environments to work with, and I got the pleasure of doing this a lot when I was at NASA, uh, is uh, called TMEX. It's an ex extreme collaboration environment uh, uh, that started at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and it's been copied all around the place, especially in the aerospace world, where you essentially have uh, a team that does a conceptual design uh, uh, in response to a need, a, a project that comes from a set of customers with specific science missions. And you have a facilitator right on top. I'm probably going to mess it up if I try to use this. But you have a facilitator who works with uh, a number of subsystem chairs who basically represent the major subsystems of an aircraft and try to work individually and together to come up with a spacecraft that will accomplish the mission, which is either sending off a payload or uh, some science exploration on there. What we'd like to do is actually be able to in include um, potential failure um, information and analyses into that process. And we'll come back to that process a little bit. I, and along with many people in my field, view enabling um, safe, the use of safety and reliability as uh, being critical principal drivers of design. And um, you know, doing it this way is, is really the way we're uh, trying to approach it. We also focus on lots of models and tools that, be, that are used in those collaborative environments. Uh, this is another depiction of the TMEX-like environment with the facilitator and the various um, subsystems and uh, systems functions. Uh, this is a little hard to see, but um, typically there's um, three or four top-level objectives that are given by the facilitator, in this case commonly as power mass and data rate. The team together uses a set of tools and methods um, like the ones listed here. This is a set of tools that they use for designing uh, a re reusable launch vehicle. Uh, that could ma range from just simple spreadsheets with uh, you know, mass and cost models to actually more detailed simulation tools to try and figure out how to get there, the trajectory, or uh, understand engine performance. These are kind of sophisticated tools that have experts using them. Uh, most likely, the, any reliability and safety modeling information will be done in a spreadsheet, uh, unless they've done, you know, some teams might have gone beyond that. So there's a lot of work trying to actually change that and have some more analysis tools um, used during that stage. We would like to do that. You know, that a lot of our work is in trying to work with this kind of an uh, environment, specifically TMEX. I've worked with them a lot. I've taught with them. Uh, they've come to my model-based design class uh, pretty much every year. We would like to help them make risk-based decisions, risk-informed, not risk-based decisions um, uh, for their designs. We also focus on automating this process, as I said before. Uh, and use model-based design approaches. You know, we all start from requirements, either performance or functional requirements. 
Um, we have typically, if it's a redesign and des or design of a, a spacecraft, there's kind of predefined set of subsystems that people know about with a lot of data and models. What we'd like to do is actually enable that kind of TMAX setup um, it, by using uh, model integration. So instead of having um, you know, negotiations between the subsystems to come up with results, you know, can we use um, models and an integration um, mechanism to do that? In our lab, we've used uh, Phoenix Integrations uh, Model Center to do that integration, which worked really well. But there are a lot of uh, other integration uh, software that can be used there as well. And I believe Autodesk is working on one too. So they were really interested in finding out about what we did. All right, so given that, I wanted to give a kind of brief, rather high level overview, considering it's already been 20 minutes, uh, of the kind of work that we've done in the past, uh, mostly by, uh, funded by DARPA, and the kind of work that I have funded now in my kind of small capacity uh, and bandwidth as an associate dean. So the work that we had, uh, uh, funded for many, many years when I got to NASA was funded by NASA, uh, DARPA's Adaptive Vehicle Make program. Their goal was there to, you know, have some kind of GUI where you, a designer would start um, and start getting pieces from databases, put it together by looking at databases of components and subsystems maybe, databases of, of models that they can use, either get the results or actually simulate them, run them, and then come up with this design digitally. And the idea there was to compress the design timeline by 5x, which I think if you think about it, that's a ridiculous number. 5x is very, very ambitious, but that's the way DARPA typically works. They just throw out a number there and see who can make it and um, maybe get close enough. So that design then, the expectation is that it's close enough to the final design because we've done a lot of analyses, you know, we've looked at the potential failures, we've room filtered those out, we've verified the design so that it meets the requirements and um, the prototyping then is a lot less, a lot, uh, less error prone in, in a way and cheaper. So our role in that was to actually come up with a framework where we would um, build a model library with multi-level design abstractions, build a library of system requirements, and then go through this kind of set of uh, filters, if you will, to um, then come up with a near optimal solution. So we would start with an automated architectural synthesis. And those of you who know um, Tolga Kutolu and Matt Campbell, that's what that method was based on. We actually partnered with Palo Alto Research Center where Tolga um, currently is, has a very high up position. Then that would give us a set of feasible solutions that satisfy um, architectural requirements. Then we'll do another filter where we would look at what we call the functional reliability analysis based on some of the work my group had done where we would um, basically filter out things that are not reliable. And from that get an estimate of reliability and then we would do what we call design verification as the last filter where we would actually look at the system design that we came up with and make check verify whether that meets the requirements and how well that meets the requirements and come up with what we ended up calling a probabilistic certificate of correctness or PCC and then have a op near optimal solution I don't like the word optimal so the early design stage models, I know I've had some questions about that. You know, uh, you're all probably familiar with functional models and configurational models. Um, a lot of this was implemented in SysML, which is a, a language, a tool we use in systems engineering quite a bit. And also we had behavioral models that are basically state machines. So it's kind of a highly qualitative uh, uh, simulation tools. Very high level models, and this is kind of the the key and the challenge of doing things in the early design stages, right? We don't actually have those detailed models and we should not have those detailed models because we're starting with an early design. We also, in addition, have in the library more detailed models of component failures to see how we can augment uh, a component behavior with failures. So we've, uh, we, you know, we created quite a few of these models with lots and lots of students. 
And then we uh, put all of these things into a design repository that actually was transferred from um, Missouri by Rob Stone to then be housed at Oregon State University. And these databases then would be used as the basis for that uh, integrated framework. The functional reliability analysis or functional failure analysis is based on a work that was funded for the longest time by AFOSR first and then NASA and then DARPA to some extent in making it actually implementable and now NSF uh, to actually look at some um, mapping of the sy very two system representations from functional to, to confi configurational to then um, insert some critical fault scenarios and see how things propagate in the system. These are kind of like uh, uh, the types of reasoning that we put in there. Um, it basically simple behavioral rules, if then else um, logics, to do some reasoning and mapping between function and failure. And then the idea is then we would be able to see how a failure propagates into the system and results in a loss of a function, maybe a critical function or maybe not and then the designer can take action from that. The last piece of that work was what I called the probability of correctness or pr probabilistic certificate of correctness where, um, prob the, where that was defined as the probability that the design meets its uh, requirements. And this was done by my colleague Chris Hoyle who was then a postdoc and now a faculty member where you would start with Modelica models. This is a, a, a ramp uh, in a tank. Um, we look at performance requirements, understand which ones are, have uh, st stochastic inputs and understand the tolerances of those inputs. And then look at um, how well those requirements are met. You know, how well does the engine RPM meet the target value? How well the vehicle, does the vehicle uh, reach the target velocity value? And come up with a, a probability, probability there that we then gave as this is how likely it is that this design will meet that requirement. And he did a lot, a lot of very complicated analyses and si sensitivity analyses that I'm not going to go into. He'd be the best one to ask about that. And we have papers on that if you're interested. The second thing I wanted to talk about is then um, taking that failure um, analysis method. And um, we wrote an NSF proposal that kind of had questions that we had unanswered. And they funded us. To again, uh, looking back at that, uh, we're simulating the behavior and trying to understand how designs might fail. But what abstraction levels do you use? What fidelity levels do you use for those? And this is always dependent on who starts. You know, every functional model, as you know, is different. That's my experience. Um, and then depending on what level of detail in the functional model you have, you might have different results. So that's the kind of the question that we're asking in this project. And this is just at the beginning of the project. So you might have uh, our kind of model is the rover. Um, you might have a, a uh, functional model. Um, and you could go into a little more detail and maybe one more level of detail. Then you know, how do those results differ based on the various different abstraction levels that we've used? The key here is to kind of understand that trade-off between fidelity. We want to do it rapidly. So if we go back to the uh, collaborative design environment, TMAX, those things happen very quickly. There's no time to just keep going. So there is value and cost associated with how quickly you do, you, you reach a decision. And then the believability of the results. You know, do I believe the results? Um, engineers, if they're really immersed in it, they believe it. But if they have to actually report it up to their managers, let's go for this mission. How do they, you know, they, it's, not, it's not really easy to make that decision. So that's what this project is looking at. Again, it uh, it's, it's, uh, almost requires the right kind of student to look into it in detail. So my student there is graduating now. Um, so for example, in this kind of simple um, example, the two scenarios, you lo lose your control magnitude or you have some degraded movement reactions. And these are all three levels of abstractions used for the functional model. And if you look at the functional level three, we actually lose the detect visual signal function. However, if you look at the model, 
uh, at level two, the sense status signal is, does not look like is lost. So here's a, here's a case where the level two actually shows that it's, it's OK. But if you go into a little more detail, then you can see that you, you might be losing that sense function. Again, it's a trade-off. The other part of this NSF project is um, this question comes up a lot uh, at NSF, a lot of the workshops. We all create methods. How do we validate them? How do we know our methods are right? Um, so we're working with the University of Arkansas, one of my former PhD students is a faculty there, to build um, a test bed to try and see whether we can replicate in the test bed our results. And again, very early stages, and I, let's see, I don't know if this works, but here's the case um, where we have a no nominal and a, and a one with a simple failure mode of flat tire, and we're simulating it in uh, David's uh, test bed. And then you kind of see the expected deviation from the predicted initial route. Very simple idea. And then um, you know, the challenge is how do you expand that to a large system, right? That's the, that's the biggest question out there. The other project that I fu got funded last year and we we're still working on is actually a collaboration with a colleague of mine, a set of colleagues who do um, multi-agent um, coordination uh, we're looking into, again, um, the TMEX environment to see whether we can help um, automate some of those uh, negotiations that happen. So again, in this environment, there's uh, system level requirements that are given to the subsystems. The subsystems work on their own. They come up with some results and they communicate their results. And there's a lot of negotiations that happen back and forth. And they have it, the, the process basically figured out. But what we said is, you know, can we use multi-agent coordination, which, you know, I, I can't answer too many questions about multi-agent coordination, to then use their credit assignment concept to incentivize subsystem designers so that when they design their subsystems, it's also going to be um, working towards the overall goal, goal. And we would be giving them their requirements their system level objectives and then having them go through a selection process and select the best concept. So we've uh, started looking at this using a, uh, our, our winning uh, formula SAE team. Uh, it's a very well run uh, uh, process and team. So we thought that would be challenging. So we've been looking at uh, their design teams and you know there's a lot of challenges there. What is an agent? What is a design team? Agents can be design teams, they can be subsystems, they can be variables. So a lot of things that we're learning about multi-agent coordination. And then uh, looking at the solution that they've come up with for their objectives versus ours. And I don't have enough uh, confidence in the data to actually show you that one is better than other. But basically, what we're saying is coordination and joint decision making uh, arise as a byproduct of the appropri appropriately driven uh, derived agents, and that could be subsystems and variables, and their objectives. Very fun project to work on. Um, this last one, uh, NSF project, is, I just got it funded actually, and I had, don't have a student uh, working on it yet, but this was in collaboration with Andy Dunn, some of you know. Uh, he and I work really well together. He's been always trying to get me to uh, move away from our models that we used to looking at networks, uh, network-based representation. So we wrote a proposal to kind of explore that similarity and, and really see if we can quantify robustness uh, of the system uh, by using network representations. In this case, you'd be taking a, uh, uh, an engineered system and exploring the similarity with a um, network representation uh, we have a simple test case here that we use for the proposal where, again, back to the tank, the DARPA tank, um, the model, Modelica model of uh, its drivetrain. Some simple equations that represent the behavior of that drivetrain. Then we would map that to uh, a, a network representation. In this case, this is a bipartite network where you map the variables. 
And then instead of simulating uh, the behavior, so this is the nominal behavior, and this is a slipping clutch, and this is a simple problem. So imagine if you had a large system, how much simulation you'd have to do to really understand what's happening. Then we said, can we look at network-based metrics to be able to see those changes without actually requiring the full simulation? So these are three different robustness-related metrics um, that we're looking at. Um, and the one that actually seems to work the best is this one between nominal and failed. Again, very, very beginnings of the project. Uh, but I'm very excited about looking into something that was you know, not really something that I had considered. And this is one of the really fun things about collaborations, I think. All right. And then the last one, I'm just going to go even quicker. So this is a Keck Foundation uh, funding um, that we received uh, two years ago where they, they basically bought our story that we could use computational design tools to design materials. And this is designing um, uh, materials called MORPHs, Metal organi Organic Responsive Frameworks, that basically change their properties. If uh, they have photo isomerizing units in there, they change their properties when you actually uh, shine light or uh, put water in and so on. So one of the applications we used was this hydrogen sponge idea that changes, it absorbs, and um, releases hydrogen. We use, I know nothing about the material science part of this. Uh, it's, we work with three material scientists and two of us in design. Uh, when Matt Campbell joined our team and I became associate dean, I kind of handed this over to him because it's perfectly up, right up his alley, where we use materials modeling, design rules, and uh, optimization to try to come up with ways of um, basically come up with lots of ideas and then filter them through uh, looking at the com materials-based um, computational uh, tests that they run to then try to replicate that in experiments. NSF uh, deemed this project too risky. Keck Foundation decided, well, this is kind of interesting. We really like risky projects. Um, we're not sure yet we can actually replicate the results in experiments, but it's been fun to work on. All right, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit. I have 10 minutes. I'm going to leave you with the summary here. We're really looking into integrating risk analysis into the early design environments. Really, really strongly believe that that's the only way to do it. Model-based analysis done at the system level, and some of my colleagues don't even use models. Uh, and computational tools for automating the design process are kind of the key things that we focus on. So shifting gears, I'm going to put my associate dean hat. Do you have any questions? Should I stop at this point or wait till the end? Maybe I'll just wait till the end and then we'll have plenty of time. I think I'm here till six. Uh, no, five. I have a five o'clock. You can all stay for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> I have a meeting at five, I think, by someone here, I'm pretty sure. So. Um, the College of Engineering at Oregon State has just been an amazing place for me to work on, uh, work in, because I like places where things are growing and there's a lot of momentum of and energy. So I want to kind of talk to you about our numbers a little bit. So when I started here in 2006, we had half the number of students. We have over 8,000 students. It's a third of the university right now. It's a really large um, College of Engineering. I believe we're the 12th largest College of Engineering in the United States, graduating engineers. So our engineers are very, very high in high demand. When I started, um, I don't know what the number was, but when I started my associate dean position, we had 130 faculty in 2012. We're up to 173, and we're interviewing another 15. What that does is that uh, over a third of our faculty are assistant professors. I realize here there's a lot of assistant professors. That is very unusual in a US institution, a traditional institution, to have that many assistant professors just because hiring doesn't happen that easily. Uh, one of my jobs is to work with those assistant professors, which is really, really an amazing experience, to mentor them, to provide some professional development opportunities for them, and just basically um, be there to answer questions that they have. Another exciting piece is here is that we've been, we have uh, over 20% of our faculty are women. Uh, it wasn't like that when I got there. 
Uh, the current dean actually has made it a, a, a mission to be number one in, in uh, uh, the percentage of women. And of course, uh, you know, whether you agree with that or not, what it does is really helps our students see uh, that um, you know, there's a diverse set of uh, opinions and methods and approaches and uh, basically making the world a little more creative by having diversity. And a lot of our women students actually suffer still to this day from discrimination. And so that we're hoping that's going to reduce that incidence of those as well. Um, we went through a strategic planning phase last year and came up with some strategic areas that the college is specifically focusing on. I'm going to briefly talk about the first three, but uh, in terms of the last four, so for sustainable energy, we have a, a, a really uh, top-notch nuclear science and engineering group. One of a delegation from Singapore was there last week talking to them about their reactors and their models. We have a spin-off that does modular reactors that's selling their design. That's not just that's not been finalized, but selling them like crazy. Uh, renewable energy. We have one of the uh, well, basically a world-class uh, marine renewable energy program. Uh, that's a collaboration between Washington, uh, Oregon, and Alaska. In advanced manufacturing, we've grown our presence quite a bit by hiring the right people, essentially. Uh, we have um, partnerships with a lot of these institute um, uh, efforts that are going on in the U.S., if you're fo following that at all. For materials, we actually have over 30 faculty in engineering and over 50 faculty across the university who identify themselves as material science program uh, with the material science program which is a PhD program um, and then data science and engineering of course is at the basis of everything we do so you can't get away with that in the future. So Ren, before you go on, and it, I noticed the word design doesn't appear in any of that. On that I know it's sad. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's part of everything. Okay, fair. <laughs> Intrinsic. It's intrinsic. It's true, though. When you when you look when it's you true. look at every one of these things, it's true. You know? It'd be nice to be explicit. I just comment. Let your dean know. <laughs> when I'm dean, I'll do that. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our robotics program. We have uh, one of the. It's it's just an it's been an amazing transformation. We hired one faculty who um, created the this uh, walking robot, and it became so popular that everybody paid attention. We now have ten robotics faculty. We pretty much get all of them out of CMU. Um, we also have a very strong AI group uh, led by Tom Dietrich, who's the president of of, of AAAI, uh, uh, top in the world in AI. And between them, they do a lot of work together. So we have quite a few faculty between them and also across the university who work on these things. Um, lots of graduate students are, I know this is an MIT university, so I'll brag that uh, we, in robotics, this year we had 300 applicants into the graduate student program we had for 15 slots. The people were turned down, ended up at MIT and CMU. And some people who wanted to go to CMU decided to come here. Uh, come to OSU, so it's, it's obviously a really, really huge deal. And uh, of course, robotics clubs, student clubs are great. And we're right now, what we were one of three, but we're one of five PhD programs in the country, uh, which is why we get to attract all the students into, so they get a degree in robotics. Um, various applications, we have lots and lots of different ones. I wanted to highlight three. Uh, this is a PR2 robot. It's really expensive robot, but what it what we're doing with that is we're actually putting it in the home of someone who's actually uh, on a, in a wheelchair to to test how this uh, robot would actually help um, with kind of mundane daily things like shaving and so on. So that's a test that's, that we're running. Um, we partner with our oceanography program, which is uh, I believe top five in the country to do underwater exploration. I know you guys probably have that as well. Uh, and then our pride and shine is our uh, walking robot called Atreus. Kind of looks like an ostrich. I'll just stop it so I can talk about it. So um, this is one of the only um, walking robots out there that actually mimic the gait of a human or an animal. And it uses completely passive dynamics. It uses very little energy. 
um, because it can store energy as well as use energy. So it's been an incredible, um, very popular robot uh, with DARPA. They've funded this pro um, uh, program for many, many years, millions and millions of dollars put into it. Uh, Jonathan Hurst has designed three of these, one of them designed and built in-house, one of them is at OSU, one of them is at CMU, and one of them is Michigan, so that they can work collaboratively on this, which is a really great way of doing it. All right, I'll stop that. And that's the stadium, by the way. The other thing that we're uh, really engaged in is disaster resilience. When I moved to Oregon from California, I thought I was going to run away, get away from earthquakes. Um, it turns out we're in a in very, very serious subduction, what's called subduction zone, which is different than faults, regular faults. It, they, kind of, uh, uh, they kind of kind of go under each other, and then they just the spring effect releases so much energy that it creates a really, really high level earthquake, and with that, a tsunami. Of course, we have a lot of communi communities around the uh, coast that are potentially impacted with it. The prediction says that it'll actually come all the way to Corvallis, which is 50 miles from the coast, and wipe out everything when that happens. Apparently, these earthquakes have happened in the past, every 300 years. And the last one uh, was uh, longer than that. Uh, um, we're, we're overdue for one. And the last one actually was felt all the way in Japan. So, and it's just right off of our coast. So we have a very strong civil engineering group that does uh, tsunami work, uh, structures, reinforced concrete, and all as well as preparing the communities and decision-making types of tools to make that, that um, resilient community happen more than just with structures, but with uh, policies. Uh, we have, um, I believe, the largest um, a facility for tsunami testing in the country. It's, it's used by uh, very many people. And um, um, but they tell me that it's real and will happen, and we're not ready for it. So it's a little scary. And the last thing I wanted to talk about is a really interesting program we started. And it got so much attention that donors started coming up with a lot of money to actually get to go in, in humanitarian engineering. What's really nice about this is that it really actually attracts a very diverse set of students and not just from engineering. There's just so many aspects to that. Here's uh, the director of our program, Kendra Sharp, in India, trying their local tools. We have faculty in uh, um, the School of uh, Oceanography and Earth Sciences implementing sensors in Eastern Africa and looking at water collection methods in Ethiopia. Um, we have now an undergraduate minor in humanitarian engineering, which uh, really attracts a lot of people into engineering. And we also have a Peace Corps Master's International Program. So I'm going to leave and there. 46 minutes exactly. And I thank you for your time. Any questions for May I ask any questions? I know a lot of you. At least your design team and I talked about a lot of these ideas. Well, I'll, I'll start here. Yeah. So when, when I went to my undergraduate school in, in design, eh, we had this concept of factor of safety. Mm. Uh huh. Is this an outdated uh, concept now, or you still have uh, this? In well, the I teach that. <laughs> I teach uh, out of well, I don't anymore. But one of the classes I taught was mechanical component design, Shigley just your regular uh, component design class where I teach factors of safety. In, um, I think the answer is yes, it's still there. But these system level failures that we're trying to um, identify, that concept doesn't quite work with that, right? It's more component, yeah, component based. You have incorporated statistical analysis failure and so on, right? Yeah, so right. So, so it's some, it some kind of margin of, or what probability of failure would it be accepted? Yeah, acceptable in the design. De depends, depends on your application, right? It completely depends, depends on, on your application. Of the yeah. yeah. Depends on how much risk you're willing to take. NASA, that is not very, you know, it's not a very risk uh, tolerant mm -hmm. field. I think uh, uh, Elon mm. is a lot more 
That's risk right. tolerant. So it d depends a lot. And a lot of methods that we use for risk analysis in are probabilistic, probabilistic risk assessment that includes fault trees, event trees, uh, reliability block diagrams that include probabilities, uh, and then simple tools like FMEAs, fina fina um, uh, failure mode and effects analysis. They just basically include rankings of severity and occurrence and likelihood. A lot of t a lot of it based on safety factors and uh, you know, historical data about about failures. Jason, you got a question here? Sorry, we'll, we'll come back. Back. Sorry, please. Just curious, one thing I, I don't know much about it. Uh, when you talk about competition models and material, I was wondering how how similar is that or how different is it from uh, when they use combinatorial methods for designing drugs? Uh, very similar. Okay. Yeah. So we uh, actually got it. Started looking. Not we, our my uh, collaborators started looking to drug design and realized that it's actually very similar. Yeah, because, yeah, but this yeah. The industry is doing a lot of that. Yeah, and it's the only industry that does that actually. Material science is not done that way. Mm -hmm. They just they just come up with something and then make it. Right. So it's a very interesting parallel. One here, Srini, did you have one? Yes. Um, failures to some extent or to a large extent depend on the environment in which the systems operate. So do you model environment and? Uh, you can, okay. you can definitely, and it's just how um, you know how large your boundary uh, control boundary is. is you the, the function models that you showed were primarily of the system. Of right? the okay. system, they did not include the environment, okay. but you certainly can okay. do that. Okay. Brad, do you have one? Yeah, I was uh, just like a detailed question. I saw you were using a state-space modeling tool. I thought you said it was called SIS. Or what was the name? SysML. Oh, S Y S M L. You can just type it and uh, use the. Um, you, you have, you have a lot of information about it. It's used pretty commonly. No. Other question. Uh, how about uh, in addition to the environment? How about in use uh, behavior? Have you considered that? In use behavior. Yeah, user behavior. Um, or user behavior. User behavior. That's what you said, right? User. Yeah. yeah user. Behavior. So the the person who interacts yeah. with it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's an interesting question. So, so the shuttle, for example, um, has lots of wires, lots and lots of wires, the space shuttle. And the most common failure they find are people actually stepping on those wires. That's, that's why failures happen. Um, so yes, absolutely, that is a very important piece of it. Um, in the kind of the system models we've worked on, we, we haven't done that, but it's, um, you know, it's part of it. Yeah. So one thing you're doing is you're looking at granularity or fidelity of your model. We're trying. And, it, and you're still doing it, I guess, right? Yeah. But, I mean, the result you showed so far would say that you know, as you add granularity, you're going to detect more. more yeah. Right? yeah. So there, I wonder where, you know, does that hit, a, hit some yeah. type of optimal point or hit some type of flexion, inflection that's kinda, point? That's kind of where we are. So my student there just kind of reached that point and he said, well, I, don't, I can keep going. I'm well, like, yeah, yes, you're right. Yeah. You can just keep getting more detail. Um, so that. We need to look into some other area methods from some other other areas to see how you can find that that break-even point, so right? It, and that's before, to me, particular chains. But it seems like, as you said, a lot of the failures are due to unknown interactions, yeah. right? Yeah. Which you get into behavior models and things like that. So I wonder, when you get there, I think you're gonna. F I, w I would think that your granularity would not have to be as much as you start looking. Probably. At these interaction effects. Yeah, and very likely. Model those more. Very, very so likely. Yeah. Just curious. But it would be fun to find. Yeah, out. it will be very fun to find. It's, it's a really important question. I mean, when we met with Autodesk a few weeks ago, um, you know, when we st they, they believe in things being done in early design, but they don't believe the results. And that question is out there oh. every time you talk to simulation people, right? You know, highly detailed simulation folks don't really know how they can use those early design models, whether they can trust them and believe them. Right. Question over here on Linda. Uh, you mentioned um, safety, reliability. <coughs> you also mentioned computation. Uh, are you doing anything in terms of cyber physical systems and security of cyber physical systems? Not security. Um, I think a lot of the systems we're looking at could be considered cyber physical systems, right? If there's a cyber, every one of them has a cyber element, 
Um, we have not <coughs> looked at security. We have been told many times that our methods could be used for security, but I don't have that knowledge. Um, if I had the bandwidth, we actually have it. We're growing our cybersecurity uh, group in electrical engineering. I would actually work with them if I had the bandwidth to do that. So, so one question I also had was, as you study more and more systems, it seemed to me that you, uh, it would be obvious that principles would arise of where you place, how you place, what the connectivity of how you mm -hmm. of things you place in systems to actually remove uh, potential failures. True. Or to mitigate potential. Very failure. true. Very have true. you all tried to no, but that's take this mass of information you have and try to abstract it back up? To that, that it's, al it's always in the back of our minds to do something like that. Yeah, it's yeah, a very, very good observation. It'd be fun to go. Yeah. Out. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question if there is one. Please. Uh, uh, so you do uh, complex, complex systems and you do analyze uh, how system models perform and figure out what causes and how to prevent them. I'm just wondering, as a dean of a college, do you use similar tools or methodology to help <laughs> your system work? He told me about his work, so I'm just, uh, that's a good question. It's a very chaotic. So what, what, what uh, Zach is saying is, uh, can, can I use some of the methods we're using as the, as the associate dean, not dean of the college, to understand the system, right, the social system that I work in? That's a good question. <laughs> It's a very chaotic system. I don't know if it's a <laughs> complex system. It's a complicated. Well, it a complex it's a complicated system. <laughs> I don't know about complex. It's a very good question. Yeah, the interface is really good. <laughs> yeah. user and it's very user, user dependent. User it's very user dependent, right? So. Good. Well, let's thank Ramya. If you have other questions, very much. Thank you. Thank you.